it looks like we have everyone, so I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing of September 13th, 2023. On the agenda today, we have deliberations, uh, including the University of Vermont Medical Center, Central Vermont Medical Center, Porter Medical Center, and potentially Copley and Northeastern. Although my understanding is that we're very unlikely to get to Copley or Northeastern, <clears throat> and there's some continued staff analysis that's going on relating to those two. So I don't anticipate we'll get to those. Um, we'll also have the standard budget order conditions and the potential vote is noticed on those. Um, so I think we'll start with the medical center itself. And before we get started, um, I wanted to announce, I think a lot of people know already, but Director Lindbergh um, will be moving on from the care board on Friday. Friday's her last day. Um, as everyone knows, she's had a tremendous career here and we'll give her a proper send off on Friday. Um, she could have left earlier. Obviously, her future employer wanted her services as soon as they could possibly get their uh, hands on them. Um, but she did the care board and the state a huge favor um, by staying on and getting us through uh, the hospital budgets. And not only that, she's been working day, night, and weekends, and really her dedication has just not let up. So I want to thank Director Lindbergh for that. Um, we also are fortunate to announce that Elena Baraby will be the uh, future Green Mountain Care Board Director of Health Systems Finance. Uh, Elena has been with us in the past. She used to be a director of the health policy team, and she's currently working on her PhD at Dartmouth. And she has stepped up to partner with Director Lindbergh and the hospital budget team um, throughout the summer and has really taken on a huge load. And it's a huge thank you to Elena um, for jumping in like this. And we're really, really thrilled um, to have such a talent and uh, such a bright future with our hospital team. So thank you both. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Fisher. Uh, just a, a process question. I don't see the slide deck up yet. I don't know if it's on its way, but um, would, would love to see it on the web page if possible. Yes, I'm sorry. This Great. is Flora Pagan. Um, I, I am working on the upload now. It's just a little time because of the internet and me being connected to the presentation as well. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I'll turn it to um, uh, Director Lindbergh and Ms. Baraby. Okay, um, so uh, my team's instance says I'm sharing my screen. Does anyone else see slides? Okay, great. Okay, but all right, let me just stop and restart. See if that helps. <clears throat> All right, any luck this time? All right, fantastic. So uh, good morning for the record. Uh, my name is Sarah Lindbergh, the outgoing uh, Director of Health Systems something. I never figured out the title. Um, health Director of Health Systems Finance. Um, and uh, we'll be joined today by Elena Barabee, as, as we already covered, and Russ McCracken, our staff attorney. Uh, so the agenda for day, today is we'll spend a moment uh, just regrounding ourselves in the process that we're using for hospital budget review uh, deliberation this year. Uh, we will deliberate on the University of Vermont Medical Center, Central Vermont Medical Center and Porter Hospital, uh, which comprise the Vermont contingent of the University of Vermont Health Network. And then we will have a potential vote on the standard budget conditions. Uh, we will have a short recess between those two agenda items to uh, get, offer a chance for board member Merman to rejoin us for the standard budget condition presentation and vote. Uh, we will not have a chance to uh, address the final two hospitals until Friday, so appreciate everyone's patience in that process. So uh, the general approach we took this year is for each hospital budget submission that came in, we stopped to evaluate whether or not they were able to meet the uh, benchmark for net patient revenue growth, which was at or, or below 8.6% uh, growth from fiscal year 22 actuals to the fiscal year 24 budget. Uh, there were two hospitals that were able to do that and they were approved without modification. And for those that were above, the board is uh, evaluating and weighing several factors as they consider modification, such as the reasonable of the budget uh, assumptions, 
um, how each expense factor compares with rest reference ranges, uh, the expense growth and its comparison with peers, uh, what it looks like compared to projected inflation as measured by the Medicare market basket um, and wage growth, other factors and criteria established in the guidance and statute. So that we're, this is the side of the tree we're on, uh, the no side. And so we are here to talk about the University of Vermont Medical Center. So I will change over to the summary of the information so far. All right, so zoom in just a little bit here. Uh, so as you see, uh, there have been uh, some very slight uh, modifications to the submitted NPR since fiscal year 18. Um, some of those uh, hit both NPR and the commercial rate, um, but last year there was a adjustment to the commercial NPR, but not to the NPR. And we see that um, in recent years, uh, an increasing reliance on the commercial rate. So that is how much the increase uh, counteracts or interacts with the uh, amount of commercial uh, gross revenue in the payer mix. Uh, we also see that like a lot of hospitals that there were uh, unfavorable operating results in fiscal year 20. Um, however, it does look like those um, have uh, rebounded pretty healthily in the case of the medical center. Uh, as far as expense growth factors, um, the growth in compensation per FTE was 3.9%, which was the seventh highest right in the middle among Vermont hospitals. Um, the utilization assumption of 8.2% was uh, quite high and a little bit above the median um, and certainly above the benchmark range. Uh, I think increasing utilization and addressing access is a good thing. So as from a staff perspective, uh, that's not a number that gives me pause and is encouraging that they've been able to realize that. Um, the pharmaceutical expense growth at 30.7% um, is quite uh, quite high, uh, the very highest among our Vermont uh, hospitals. There are only seven uh, of the 14 that break out this expenditure, so they're the highest at seven. Um, they also are one of the only facilities that offer um, some of the uh, more expensive and uh, other pharmaceuticals, so uh, they were able to, in their record to kind of explain their approach to that and help us try to understand um, how much of that actually uh, affects uh, what is asked for in their uh, their rate increase, which is not by no means that entire amount. Um, as for cost inflation, uh, they're at the fifth highest at 3.7%, which is right at the median. So that seems to be in line with what we would expect. Um, I think it's important to note that uh, as compared to the fiscal year 23 approved budget and the year-to-date results, we're seeing uh, a more favorable operating margin and operating a bit of margin and total margin than was budgeted. So despite the um, rate adjustment that was made last year, it seems like um, the 14.77% granted last year is um, helping them to recover. Um, and we see that um, the budgeted amounts for fiscal year 24 are largely unchanged, um, seeing a little bit of a dip in cash, and that's a little bit lower than we ideally would see um, in a healthy uh, financial outlook. As far as the ratio of administrative and general salaries to clinical salaries, in the cost reports as filed, this proportion is 31%. Um, however, the network uh, in their in one of the letters, they responded to our questions to adjust that to better allocate the shared services across the network. And so um, to make sure to kind of try to address that, we have adjusted that here to 24.36. Uh, in all honesty, I was a little on the fence about that because um, not everyone on that list had the luxury of kind of doing that exercise. So I think that's definitely an opportunity for future work to make sure that we can measure that in as apples to apples a way as possible. Um, 
after that adjustment, it's the ninth highest ratio for that indicator among Vermont hospitals and is at the 71st percentile among their comparators, which is the Association of American Medical College Hospitals. Um, the CMI adjusted average cost per Medicare discharge is at $14,277, which is the 12th highest among Vermont hospitals and is the um, 83rd percentile among their peers, so um, above the interquartile range. Um, the relative pricing looks a little bit different since the only comparator we have is Dartmouth-Hitchcock or Mary Hitchcock Hospital. Um, so what we see here is a pretty stable trend where the cost, commercial cost per discharge is higher at DMH. Uh, or at, at Dartmouth um, as compared to UVMMC. Um, however, UVMMC and Dartmouth had pretty similar cost coverage ratios up until fiscal year 22, where we do see that uh, UVMMC had a more favorable cost coverage ratio than Dartmouth. Um, we also see that um, for the standardized price on the inpatient side, UVMMC is right at the median um, among major teaching hospitals. However, when we look on the outpatient side um, at 351, um, they're above the 75th percentile on that uh, standardized commercial price. Um, as far as uh, the comparison to Dartmouth on outpatient, we see that the um, relative cost coverage is quite a bit higher um, at UVM than it is at Dartmouth-Hitchcock. Um, if if uh, the hospital were underfunded, that's not necessarily a, a trend that I would expect to see. So I, I think at least on the outpatient side, it seems like um, the commercial cost coverage is uh, adequate. Any questions about the deliberative summary before I turn back to the PowerPoint presentation? Okay. Okay. Are you seeing University of Vermont Medical Center budget request? All right, wonderful. Um, so here we're looking at uh, what the fiscal year 23 approved budget was, which was $1.7 billion, which was a 10.8% increase over fiscal year 22. The budget submitted for 24 is $1.8 billion, which is a 7.6% increase over the fiscal year 23 projection. Um, when we look at the two years from the fiscal year 22 actual to what was submitted for fiscal year 24, it's an increase of $356 million, which is a 23.8% increase. Uh, as far as the commercial change in charge, or not, I'm sorry, the change in charge applies to all payers equally. That would be on the gross, so it doesn't matter um, if the who the payer is. But the charge master increase has been 10% for both of those years for a two-year total of 20%. Um, the University of Vermont Network Hospitals do have a different metric they submit called the commercial effective rate. So the way that works is they tally up the cost inflation um, that they have uh, experienced and that was not covered by governmental payers, and they figure out how much of uh, the current commercial uh, reimbursement is needed to cover that cost inflation. And so the board approved 14.77% uh, in that effective rate increase in fiscal year 23. And the network submitted an additional increase of 13.45%, which is a total growth of 28.22%. Um, the NPR growth is the highest among all the Vermont hospitals, and the um, change in the commercial rate is on the higher end of those submitted for the two years. If we were going to look at how these um, factors compare with seven-year inflation over two years, that would be a $226 million reduction um, for NPR or about a 10.5% decrease. Um, and that would um, only be achieved with a negative 7.8% change in the commercial effective rate to get to 7% over the two years. If we were going to only apply the 3.1% in cost in, uh, in Medi Medicare 
market basket to the um, commercial effective rate, that would bring the two-year total to 17.87%. So uh, that's pretty close to the top end of what we've been seeing in this two-year period. And um, just, I think, is a testament that the, they got a little bit higher rate last year than some of the peer hospitals. Um, and uh, that reduction is $119 million, or a minus 5.6% reduction uh, in NPR, if it were applied there. Um, looking at uh, this performance summary, um, the expense growth at 15.3% is at the 96th, 92nd percentile among Vermont hospitals. Um, that adjusted proportion of admin and general salaries to clinical salaries is at the 71st percentile among their peers of um, academic medical centers, association uh, thereof. Um, that Medicare um, CMI adjusted cost per discharge at the 83rd percentile we just covered. And as we just mentioned, uh, the standardized price for inpatient is right at median, um, but the outpatient is at the 84th percentile. Um, so here for the um, rate changes over time, we're looking at that commercial effective rate. So over the five-year period from fiscal year 19 to 23, um, that was just under 37%, um, which is the 92nd percentile among Vermont hospitals. If you were just to look at charge increases, they're at the 62nd percentile. Um, we don't uh, quite have 10 years of the commercial effective rate, but nine years of it is at 53.8%, which is also at the 92nd percentile among Vermont hospitals. Um, but the charge uh, percentile is much lower at the 15th. Um, just want to say that um, we are seeing a notable change in operating results since the rates that were approved in fiscal year 23 went into effect. So um, just seeing that recovery is really starting to materialize um, in the operating results through June. Uh, don't have anything more recent to that, but um, seems uh, seems like that is um, translating to some uh, more beneficial operating results. Um, and with that, I will uh, turn. Oh, yeah. Uh, the rate changes that went into effect from last year's budget decision, OK, those start in January. Correct. And are they all effective January, or is there like a lag? Are they all become effective on the same day, to our knowledge? Um, I don't think that every single group would renew on January 1, but the lion's share um, of rates do go into effect in January 1. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Oh, no, not at all. Um, and with that, I will um, turn it over to my colleague. Um, uh, all right. All right. All right. All right. Okay, sorry about that coordinating. Um, so Sal will keep driving. Thank you. So I think in an effort to understand the magnitude of the change, um, thinking about opportunities, we kind of dug deeper. This um, subsequent slides are not exhaustive of revenue or efficiency considerations, um, but wanted to highlight a couple that that kind of came to our attention through the process. So the first one is uh, case, mix, case mix index. Um, so there's been robust discussion about how Medicare reimbursements for UVMMC have historically been low compared to relative peer groups, um, citing the Atlas and other sources. And then in its 8, 9, or 817 letter, um, the hospital discussed its recent implementation of iodine, a software uh, technology that will augment DRG coding. Um, and this will lead to higher acuity of patients being reflected um, per the EMR. Um, and this has implications for kind of the magnitude of the reimbursement um, from Medicare, but also potentially from other payers. Um, so while the Medicare estimates were communicated to be around, you know, to go up to 2.3 from a 2.06 in FY22 per the Medicare cost reports, um, you know, it's unclear kind of how these, um, but the impacts are uh, further than this. So we, the staff requested further information to understand this impact um, and uh, UVM was responsive. Um, so you can go to the next slide. 
Um, but there still remains a lot of uncertainty about um, kind of how these estimates were derived and how comprehensive the impact is. So we understand that um, the methodology for, uh, for estimating the potential revenue opportunity cannot be shared. Um, they did share, however, how they got from kind of the 23 Medicare CMI to the future Medicare CMI of 2.3, uh, but it's unclear kind of what is included in the budget um, versus what this potential future state could be. Um, and then in addition to that, um, it wasn't super clear, you know, the magnitude of the impact on some of these other private payers. Um, we did receive a public comment from Blue Cross Blue Shield that estimated their impact to be around 11 million um, because they do have some DRG based methodologies. So this so be, assuming this algorithm um, is you know done across the board for all patients, um, you know, it would have this impact. So this is what we know or we know of estimates. So I, it sounded like the Medicare impact would be around 20 million. Um, Blue Cross Blue Shield impact would be around 11 million. Again, it's not clear how this, you know, deviates from inpatient, outpatient, and kind of the full scope. There's likely an impact on Medicaid, um, MVP, other commercial payers, um, you know, to the extent that bad debt and free care, I don't know how those estimates are derived, but if they're um, attached to DRG methodologies, there could be an impact. So at the very minimum, there could be a $31 million impact, and we, we really don't know what the total impact could be or over what period of time. Um, so we understand that this um, technology has been implemented and is, is starting to ramp up, but um, it'd be great to know how, how things are going and, and what that will look like for next year. Okay. Um, this is another point of conversation that has gone back and forth on the um, sale of investments. So we understand that there was 61 million um, of financial gains, though only 10 million um, were realized. Um, so depending on how the market continues to go up or down, there you know could be a potential um, for some more um, opportunity there if if you needed to plug a budget. Um, so we could go to the next slide. Um, in addition to that, there does appear to be some unanticipated net income. So um, while the approved margin was around 2.4, the FY23 projected margin is coming in at 3.8%. So that was that slide um, Sal showed earlier. If you put this in dollar terms, um, and that should be, sorry, October through June um, is around 41 million um, in the approved versus actual is around 25. So if you annualize this, um, that gets to kind of almost 83 million or, or 50 million. Um, in addition, there appear to be some Medicaid rate increases um, in New York, around 7.5% that are not reflected in this budget. Um, so that could theoretically decrease the impact or the reliance on commercial rate. Um, they estimated this to be around 2.2 million, but it'd be great to understand if these rates were approved or how that might affect the rate. In addition, operating expenses do seem to be outpacing inflation. Um, so if we look at the two year at 7%, that puts us over 7% at all hospitals. UV of MC 8% and the other hospitals between three and 10. If we look at the median relative to um, median relative to um, other Vermont hospitals, it, it, we are between two and 9% and for these hospitals. Um, we also dug into the shared administrative services, um, so I <clears throat> wish I had more time to organize this in a way that would be easy to follow, so I'll do my best to explain it. Um, so I think in the record, um, the hospital indicated that they were at median based on the Centellus benchmarks, which is an external data source to allow hospitals to understand how they're operating and admin expenses compared to peers. If, you know, there are a lot of assumptions that go into that. Um, so what is, so here we only have information on Vermont hospitals. So we're not able to do kind of a comprehensive analysis with the New York data as well. Um, so I've varied kind of based on at the high level at this top box, I used a 84.6% Vermont share um, of business based on UVM submitted gross patient revenue. Um, and in the box below, I assumed um, a 77.6% share between Vermont and New York based on the 
fiscal year 22 Medicare cost reports. So that um, is kind of a more conservative approach. So if I use the FY22 Medicare cost report, so that bottom box, um, it does look in, like an aggregate um, the hospital is kind of at median compared to peers. Um, however, it, that would assume that the operating budget in Vermont is efficient because that would be the denominator. So if you look out to the right, if we assume that operating expenses should grow with two-year inflation, this would put them at a higher median, um, higher than median for their shared admin expenses. Um, if we compared, and I didn't, again, have time to build this out totally, but if we compared to kind of median hospital um, OPEX growth in the state, that would also put them over the median. Um, so I, I took the most conservative approach, assume that they were at the median for shared expenses, and we can go to the next site. But when you look at kind of the line item detail, there are a couple areas of admin shared expenses that look a little bit um, high. So human resources, about double that of peers, IT is almost two, and then revenue cycle was almost four times um, what peers spend. Um, so this is kind of a subset of what was submitted in their budget. Again, this is using all of their data, just kind of trying to understand some of the assumptions that go in there. So um, despite conservative assumptions, it looks like so this was the assuming everything on this page assumes that their admin expenses were at the median and that in aggregate they're appropriate um, given the operating the submitted operating budget and so it looks like there could be some opportunity here to to get back to to median um, so I quantified that amount given the conservative estimates and that puts EVM at another you know 91 million that could come down um, potentially. Okay. All right, I'll turn it back over to Sal. Oh. All right, did I do it? Can you hear me? No echo? Okay. Wow. All right. So uh, the staff recommendation here, um, our recommendation would be to allow the uh, required NPR and FPP growth as budgeted at 23.8%. Um, however, uh, we would recommend uh, adjusting the amount of that revenue that could come through price um, down from the 10.0% change in charge down to 3.1%. Uh, there also is interest in including an additional condition uh, for mo monthly monitoring um, and to submit within three months an improvement plan addressing some areas of particular concern. Uh, the rationale for this is that it would bring the two-year um, growth uh, closer to peers in Vermont. Uh, the fact that the current year-to-date performance results are outpacing the budget um, leads us to believe that um, that. Uh, some of those continuing results are likely to continue to manifest uh, through the rest of fiscal year 23 and beyond. And seeing that the relatively high, um, as defined as being above the 75th percentile in expense growth, cost per discharge, and admin to clinical salaries suggests that there might be opportunities for efficiency um, to help keep uh, these numbers whole without such high reliance on the um, rate increase. Um, so that's what uh, I have to say for the moment. Back to you, Chair Foster. Um, thank you. Uh, is, there a, is there a motion, a draft motion? Um, I, I will open it up to board member comments and, and questions. I'll go ahead and jump in first. Um, Sarah, could you speak a little bit more to the rationale for maintaining the NPR growth at nearly 24% over two years? Absolutely. Um, I think as we covered, um, I think we're all concerned about some of the access limitations. And so I think that um, allowing there to be incentives to increase utilization and address some of those access issues, um, as well as some of the 
other opportunities to increase revenue without it being um, based on a price increase, um, such as um, some of the CIMI optimization, um, mean that um, that, that growth probably is appropriate and war warranted, um, but trying to balance that with the toll it takes on uh, commercial rate payers um, is what we're trying to balance. Thank you. Um, that was my only question. I do have a, a couple of comments um, in terms of how I'm thinking about this hospital and its budget. Um, so I am supportive of ensuring that the state's only academic medical center and the Chittenden County's community hospital have a financial stable platform to operate um, at a price that commercial uh, commercially insured patients can afford. Um, I'll note that it it is concerning to me to have an NPR growth of 24%. Um, however, given the access issues and the opportunities there for ensuring that more patients are able to be seen in state at our academic medical center, um, I will support it. I would, however, note that this is an unprecedented NPR increase over a two-year period, at least looking back to the data that I could find in our 2023 annual report. The, the next highest prior to COVID, recognizing there's some COVID confounding more recently, uh, was in 2005 to 2007. Uh, which was about a 17% NPR growth over a two-year period. And if my recollection serves, it was at that point that the state legislature actually stepped in and capped NPR, overriding the regulator who at that time was uh, Banking Insurance Securities and Healthcare Administration. Um, however, uh, access is a big deal, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to improve that and keep Vermonters in state, as well as uh, many of the other uh, items that you both discussed today. Um, I am also comfortable with the 3.1% charge increase. Uh, last year's rate increase was large. We are seeing that adding stability um, in this year's margins, which is good. Um, and I think allowing for an inflationary increase is necessary as well. Um, I would just note that as the board discussed in a great detail in 2019, uh, over-reliance on commercial rate as a way to ensure financial stability is problematic in a state with our median household income. And uh, this is why we sought legislative uh, support for looking into sustainability um, and how we as a state uh, as a whole can um, ensure that Vermonters can continue to access services in their home communities uh, to the greatest extent possible in an affordable manner. Uh, there are, I think, opportunities in addition to access that can be pursued um, by any hospital, and I have faith that the talented management team at the network will be able uh, to do the work that's needed uh, to find those opportunities and take advantage of them. Um, lastly, I would just note that last week, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation announced a new payment reform initiative called the AHEAD model, uh, which is a model that a state like Vermont could consider pursuing. Part of that model includes uh, global hospital budgets, which require new and creative ways of thinking about financing hospital services, an increased focus on expenses and health improvement, and uh, I mention this because I think that that will be a culture change for all of our hospitals. Um, and I'm hopeful that given uh, the network's focus on population health as evidenced in their information around um, their efforts to standardize that across the network, that they could be a leader in moving forward um, with that creative thinking. So those are my thoughts, thanks. 
Thank you. Um, other board members? Sure, I'll, um, I'll go, uh, Chair Foster, and, and thank you, Member Lunge. Um, I've grown comfortable with the 23.8% increase in NPR uh, for reasons mentioned. Um, we have um, an access issue in the state. We have a backlog of people needing primary care appointments. We have um, severe um, need for more mental health services, substance use services. Um, we've had a worsening um, and rapidly rising crisis with suicides across the state. There are a number of areas that deserve um, greater attention that would need more utilization of care. So uh, allowing for that much growth, I've, I've come to be comfortable with. Um, I'm still struggling with the 3.1% increase in charge. I think it could be lower. I think given the information that's been presented today and reviewed over the past few weeks, there's a sound argument, data-driven, evidence-based, to cut rates. So I'm eager to hear what the, remain, what the remaining board members have to say. Um, I'd like to also, as Robin did, make a comment. Um, through my career, I've worked with hospitals across the country and seen a number of them under financial stress. Hospitals under financial stress across the country take several predictable steps. Their executives voluntarily cut their salaries. They decrease administrative layers. And they put off infrastructure projects, all in order to maintain services to patients. Our hospitals, are not doing that. They're investing in additional administrative services called shared savings or shared resources that are supposed to produce savings, but have not. They've ballooned the administrative layer. Our hospitals are moving forward with infrastructure projects at a time when um, they're telling us they don't have enough cash on hand to maintain services. Our hospitals are also attempting to intimidate the regulators while saying that they'll be forced to cut services because their finances are in trouble. The review of data that we've seen, our hospitals do face some headwinds, but nowhere near like others across the country. Our community an academic medical center takes pride in being the only one in the region, and they should. We have an aging population, more people moving on to Medicare. We need an academic medical center. We need a community medical center. But this is also a little bit like being the only ice cream shop at the beach. And if you can't make money at your ice cream shop at the beach, it's not the heavy hand of regulation that's the problem. It's the business model. The hospital before us today has a business model that continues to focus on expansion, adding administrative layers to build for a savings future when the savings have never materialized, and then raising prices on a shrinking population of patients with commercial payment. The prices have become unaffordable. This forces patients to forego care, yet they still become sick eventually, worse than they would have been otherwise. They still have accidents and need care, and then end up with bills they cannot pay. They go into debt to pay that. Some percentage of that end up declaring bankruptcy. When that happens, those bills remain unpaid to the hospital. So a focus on maintaining a hospital's sustainability by raising commercial prices is short-sighted. Unpaid bills will lead to an unsustainable situation. Unaffordable care threatens sustainability. With that, I'd like to turn it back over to Chair Foster. Thank you. 
Thank you, <clears throat> Member Walsh. Um, Member Holmes, do you have any comments or questions for staff? I do have a quick question for staff. Um, on slide 19, could you just pull that back up? Great. I just wanted to make sure we understood that that 91.48 is $91 million of potential opportunity over the median. Yes. Is that how we interpret that? Okay. Millions um, of dollars. Yeah. So that for that subset, and it should be millions should be on that graph. My apologies. Um, it's <clears throat> totaling that subset of items that was over the median that I showed previously allocated okay. to the hospitals based on their NPR, which is how they reported they perform that shared services allocation. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Just wanted to clarify the the level there. Okay, thank you. Um, appreciate it. Um, so, in terms of, I mean, this is this is hard, right? We are all in a very difficult position, and, um, and I respect that the networks are in a different difficult position. We've gotten lots of public comments um, on all sides of this issue. Um, just to frame where I'm sitting as I look at this potential motion language here, um, I viewed last year's budget as a recovery budget. So the approved rate increase of 14.8% last year was higher than almost all other hospitals and well above inflation last year. It was designed to be a one-time bump to shore up the academic medical center's um, finances. And it was a really tough rate to approve last year. I knew that that high rate would contribute to high premiums and potentially compromise access for those patients who delay care or avoid care because of cost. Um, so it was a really hard position to be in last year. And here we are again. Um, fortunately, the high rate last year did shore up UVM's position. So as, as the staff showed, the hospital has seen higher than expected revenue, higher than expected margins this year, particularly since January when that commercial rate increase kicked in. And I just want to say this is despite very public cries of woe by the network when the board didn't approve their full rate request last year. So this year's request of 13.5 is, is again high, much higher than inflation. And in my opinion, a two-year rate increase of close to 30% was not supported in this year's submission. The record actually shows that year-over-year double-digit commercial rate increases are not the only path that this hospital can use to generate financial stability. Um, there's potential for unbudgeted revenue in the tens of millions of dollars from increasing their case mix index, a process that's already underway. There's higher than budgeted reimbursements coming from New York Medicaid that will ask, also add unplanned revenue in fiscal year 24. There's tens of millions of dollars of higher than expected investment gains that are another potential revenue source that could be realized if need be. Uh, and again, the higher than expected operating margins for fiscal year 23 are another resource to be tapped. Finally, I just want to say that, that there is nothing in the record to validate that the outpatient clinics are maximizing productivity and optimizing patient throughput. During the hearing, UVM's leadership confidently said that they would share productivity measures and industry benchmarks, but we never saw that data. And all we have is the visit per clinical FTE data. Um, and we have known wait times. And that clinical visit per clinical FTE is looked low to me. Again, we didn't see other productivity measures or industry benchmarks, but we know that there are very long wait times. And so there's potential opportunity to generate additional outpatient revenue by increasing patient throughput. So on the revenue side, in my mind, there's ample evidence in the record that a double digit commercial rate increase is not the only avenue to um, to cover expense growth. And then when we look at that expense growth, there is some evidence presented by staff that suggests that there are opportunities to reduce costs that would further reduce the need for such a high commercial rate increase. Um, a reduction in admin expenses could help UVM maintain a margin with a lower commercial rate increase without even talking about service cuts. Um, and there was really not a lot of evidence presented of significant efforts to really look at expense growth and reduce it. A uh, casual ob observation um, suggests that uh, UVM, you know, I'm guessing this from the narratives and their description of how they build their budgets, but it appears 
that the network builds its budgets using an incremental budgeting approach. In other words, this year's budget forms the basis for next year's budget with adjustments upward for inflation or changing demographics or public pay or reimbursements. But the assumption in that approach is that the budget foundation is sound and incremental changes are the only ones that need to be made. And if that's the budgeting approach, then cost inefficiencies are going to be baked in and compounded year after year. An alternative approach is zero-based budgeting, which starts with a budget of zero and requires justification for every single line item. It's much more time-consuming, it's resource-intense, but a zero-based budgeting approach every few years can uncover significant cost savings. So I would love to see if they're not doing it already, uh, a zero-based budgeting approach for next year. Anyway, given the opportunities I think that I see that the staff have presented and have been um, you know, presented in the record, I think there are opportunities for revenue to be generated from sources other than commercial rate. I think there's potential for administrative cost savings. And so I don't think that the medical center met its burden to justify this year's commercial rate ask. So I do support the staff recommendation, which would still allow for a two-year rate increase of almost 18%, which far exceeds inflation. I think some others have wanted perhaps a larger cut um, or a cut in general, um, but I think that a glide path with an inflationary increase would be less disruptive. So uh, I support the staff's recommendation on charge increase. I also support approving the requested NPR in the hopes that UVM can increase productivity, increase patient throughput, and generate additional revenue by reducing wait times and providing the backlog of care that Vermonters need. So I am in support of this staff recommendation. Back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you, Member Holmes. Um, I just observed that this was a very large budget proposal calling for a 28% increase in commercial rate in two years which is a uh, multiple of medical inflation at a time when Vermonters are struggling under the weight of extremely large commercial uh, rate increases. Um, I note that UVM's own executives for years have publicly acknowledged that healthcare costs are too high. They're not just too high now, they were too high before. Yet UVM has perpetually demanded rate increases that far outpace inflation and what peer institutions appear to receive. Um, I reread our statute and I noted that the legislature has stated that overall healthcare costs need to be contained and that quote, growth in healthcare spending in Vermont must balance the healthcare needs of the population with the ability to pay for it, close quote. To me, this budget request was anything but that. Uh, we heard in connection with Vaz's request to modify the 8.6% guidance that the large rate increases were harming Vermonters' ability to afford care and that people avoid and delay care when it gets too expensive. We also had robust public comment from community providers that they've been receiving small rate increases and they were unable to bear the cost of inflation, rising nursing salaries, and face many of the same financial challenges that hospitals had. Um, and unfortunately, we have seen in our community, um, community providers close or limit access, which is bad for our system, as they too provide critical services, often in an economically efficient way. Um, having said that, I view this hospital as a cornerstone of our healthcare system. It's immensely important to our state and to the community, and it is filled with excellent providers, many of whom are friends of all of ours, who deliver extremely high quality critical services, and they do have financial challenges that need our support if we're going to maintain the access and quality of care that we need. So while I can certainly understand that a lower rate uh, increase would be appropriate based on the record that's before us, and I struggle to justify to Vermonters why another large increase on top of last year's is warranted, I think that we have to do it. I think that we need to provide this hospital an increase that keeps up with inflation so that it's time to address and rectify its inefficiencies and high administrative costs. I'd also note that they have new leadership and it may take time for Dr. Eppen to surround himself uh, with all the pieces and team and structure that he believes is appropriate and to create a culture that is in his vision to address the challenges the hospital has. So in light of those facts, I think that providing an inflationary increase is warranted. I have a couple other notes that struck me from the process. Um, I did not find evidence to support many of UVM's assertions and others I did not find credible. For instance, 
uh, the testimony and the evidence relating to CMI um, was not consistent with some of the information we received in public comment. At the hearing, the board, the guy, asked UVM for its assessments and benchmarking, and we were told we would receive it, but then UVM did not provide it and claim confidentiality. But we often review confidential information, and it's difficult to evaluate and find the claims credible if we don't have the data and information that backs it up. We had the same issue that Member Holmes discussed with the productivity data. The board asked about uh, provider productivity and what benchmarks were being used and to, to measure provider productivity. Um, but that information wasn't furnished either. And when we get incomplete answers um, or just non-answers, the credibility of those assertions is eroded. Um, I also was reflective of the 2023 um, budget process. Um, UVM's request last year seemed to be inaccurate, which is okay. We understand that these are very hard, but UVM indicated a 19.9% rate was necessary and that the board didn't approve it, there would be a parade of horribles. Um, UVM, in fact, testified last year that, quote, it really isn't until 2026 where that operating margin is back into the three-plus range where we need to be heading, close quote. But partially th through 2023, UVM is already north of a 2% margin, and at slide eight, Director Lindbergh uh, showed the trend, and the trend is decidedly upwards. So after the board reduced the rate by 5% down to 14%, the margin is still far above what UVM had testified what it would be at 19%. There's also a claim in last year's transcript and the testimony that, quote, um, that UVM was, quote, underfunded continually by our regulators, close quote. I don't think that the medical center is continually underfunded. Its prices are high, its rate increases are well above medical inflation and more than peers. Its revenue is $226 million above two-year inflation. Um, last, I think, I'm not sure exactly who it was, but there are a couple members mentioned the um, efficiencies and network costs. And the issue of consolidation increased costs has been discussed for years here in Vermont relating to the network. And UVM has consistently maintained that its expansion will behoove Vermonters by resulting in lower costs to consumers, economies of scale. In 2015, uh, UVM's CEO stated that um, uh, efficiencies in the network will create and eventually reduce costs to consumers. In 2017, member Holmes asked uh, during a hearing that one of the things she was hoping to see uh, was the benefits of affiliation and should these economies of scale uh, lead to lower uh, operating expenses. And Member Holmes noted that that's not what was seen at that time, that they actually saw some of the highest growth in expenses um, back in 2017 and asked, quote, when and where and how are we going to start to see the efficiencies? UVM's CFO is quoted as saying that every entity right now is an island to itself from a technological perspective with different billers trained in different operating systems, but I'm, going to need, I'm not going to need all the same billers once they're on Epic, and that putting the infrastructure in place will deliver the efficiencies. Automation is the administrative areas, in the administrative areas is really the driver of efficiency. In 2019, the chair of UVM's health network, Ali Stickney, and Steve Leffler submitted an op-ed to VT Digger with the question of whether or not the formation of the health network would cause prices to go up. Their conclusion was, quote, uh, the answer is a resounding no, close quote. It's now years later, and these investments in hopes of efficiencies have been expensive, and Vermonters have paid for those. We'd hope to see those efficiencies by now, and that they'd show up in cost containment and containment of expense growth and more efficient and increased productivity, shorter wait times, and lower administrative costs but the record before us does not show that. UVM's answer to this question were at best anecdotal and incomplete and did not address the questions about changes in price pre and post consolidation. The administrative cost at each of the hospital networks appears quite high. Porter's at 29.25%, CVMC over 30%, and UVM nearing 25%. That's by UVM's calculation, not off of the cost report um, data that the care board analyzed. The member Holmes was concerned in 2017 because expense reduction wasn't showing. And today, six years later, I, I, I have a hard time seeing that as pulling through. And I say that because it gives me optimism that if the claims of efficiency are true, 
there remains significant opportunity to lower costs that has yet to be tapped. Um, I am concerned about a 24% NPR growth, but for the same rationale as the other members, uh, I think allowing UVM to maintain that very high NPR growth uh, is beneficial in this circumstance. Um, what is not beneficial, balancing all of our uh, statutory obligations, is a very large and unwarranted increase in uh, commercial rate. Lastly, I, I would note that the uh, claims and uh, concerns about cutting services, um, in my view, wasn't really supported. It did not look like there was uh, much evidence provided. It seemed very thin and it does not address all the other opportunities to um, uh, find efficiencies and cost savings and other revenue opportunities. So that did not give me concern. I think that UVM has plenty of ability to cut any rate reduction by increasing uh, uh, productivity, essentially tapping uh, 50 plus million dollars of unexpected investment gains, uh, finding economic efficiencies in the administrative state and also through uh, the CMI project that it spoke about. So if you look at the factors we're directed to um, consider, including Vermonters' ability to pay for the care, the efficient and economic operation of the hospital, uh, the healthcare system needing to maintain system costs and eliminating unnecessary expenditures, including by reducing administrative costs and reducing costs that do not contribute to efficient, high-quality health services, I am supportive of the budget's um, uh, proposal from the staff. I will open it up to public comment. The motion is uh, appears. We can take public comment and then we can see if anyone wants to take up the motion. Uh, Ms. Gutwin, please go ahead. Ms. Gutwin? Yeah, okay, can you hear me? Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. So I'm Sharon Gutwin, owner of a major provider of outpatient physical therapy. I'm hoping to not be thought of as speaking up against motherhood and apple pie here. I'm a mother and I do love apple pie and I do appreciate the UVM Medical Center. But I wish the hospital could understand it's not me speaking against UVM, but rather for the healthcare system as a whole which they are only a part. And it's this bigger picture that Vermonters face. In my professional lifetime since graduating from UVM in 79, that's 1979, this business has gone from being a single hospital in two parts to being a behemoth entity which has been allowed to expand far beyond being a hospital into dominating all of Vermont healthcare. Profits have fueled this expansion, and its expansion has fueled more privileged status and protection of this power. Access is a big deal, but depending on the most expensive hospital-owned care to increase access goes against affordability. Affordability is existing right now, but shrinking in the non-regulated part of the healthcare system. I certainly believe good people are running this hospital, but their perspective is from the inside, as if in a bubble, not willing to acknowledge its effects on the totality of the healthcare system, like they're the only thing. And they must be paid more, because if they're not paid more, then the whole system will crumble. This lack of awareness was witnessed in a dumbfounded response when questioned if they knew how their budget demands affect other, others in healthcare. Vermont being a small state with commercial insurer options highly limited means the hospital's appetite is being fed off the plates of other healthcare businesses such as mine and put it at risk. Testimony from Blue Cross Blue Shield confirmed that increases going to the hospital means near flat 
increases for the private sector. In my part of the private sector, while inflation has been over 35, 36, 38 percent in a period of time, I have received 8 percent. Anyone that understands math and understands inflation cannot understand how it's possible that a business could even be in business. So I have had to cut costs. I have had to cut services. And I expect every part of the healthcare system to do the same. Being unregulated, I do not get to have my financial picture considered by the state in efforts of sustainability. I have this, I have public comment. And the public frankly isn't even plugged in. They read, they read, they read uh, opinions in papers of how important the hospital is and how much the public should support them. This one-sided hospital-focused support has created disparities in payments that are in some cases in my loan per sector over 500%. Looking at this from a patient's perspective, in physical therapy where they would be subject to an expense a bit over $100 a visit coming to my business, they face a bill hundreds of dollars more per session and thousands over the course of care. Patients are not told of this and it's assumed well insurance will cover it, but their out of pocket expenses are, are, are gone up. And, and some of these people are paying 100% of these thousands of dollars more out of pocket. And the providers at the UVM Medical Center are not collaborative. They don't, they don't provide encouragement of patients to think about their options where finances are a consideration. In fact, we're repeatedly told by patients they were never given a choice. This hospital's growth is not providing for health to our Vermont population. We don't see Vermonters healthier, and it's certainly not helping their financial health. The sustainability of this healthcare system, not just a piece of it, depends on preventative care, and we hear this over and over again. But a business that profits on sick and injured cannot be expected to keep people out of their business by being healthy. But that's the image they project, right? We're going to drop, we're going to drop services in primary care or, or 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 mental health. But it's already being provided by the private sector at a more affordable rate. So I urge UVM to stop being the king of the mountain and having an attitude of superiority and collaborate instead of compete with the private sector. Instead of trying to be the, the end all of all of healthcare, look at what's already available in the community, encourage your patients to take advantage of these options to get and stay fit and healthy. In the 20 years I've been in business, not one person from the medical center has ever looked into what the rehab gym does. We're the only medically oriented gym improving the health of Vermonters. If this board, if the trustees of the hospital, if employees of the hospital really truly care about the health of Vermonters, they would want to know what's going on. I urge trustees of this hospital to educate themselves past the walls of this one entity and dive into the potential of population health improvements. If only UVM would think about divesting from services unrelated to the care of the serious ill and injured. 
That's what hospitals were designed to do. That's what they did. And when they entered this monopolization of healthcare across our nation, there has been no improvements. When are we going to learn? So trustees care about more than the financial picture of this business and get into the health of Vermonters. And I, ins and I urge insurers to stop payments based on market power and instead on what's best for their members. You're the boss to the members, not the boss. Or no, your members are the boss of you, not a hospital. They should not control your decisions. And I urge patients, if any are learning, and we all are, is to learn about options and shop around. Thanks. Thank you for your comment, Ms. Goodwin. Um, Mr. Vincent, uh, I think your hand was up next. Good morning. Um, thank you for the presentation today. I just have a few comments to make based on the discussion and the, the data that was presented in the slide. So, one, I do want to applaud the the staff for the 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 movement they've made this year in presenting more data and having data uh, be a key part of the the deliberations. But there's definitely work to be done in terms of refining that data and that benchmark. Um, you know, those benchmark sources. I think we provided some very clear evidence on one key piece of the of the the data that's being used this morning on the the administrative um, salaries to clinical salaries data that had. And again, we didn't have as much time to dig into this either, but we did have time to dig into a few of the uh, the hospitals that were part of the benchmark, and we clearly showed that if everybody used the proper columns on the cost report like we did when we calculated our 24 percent that you can see dramatic changes um, in what those results would be uh, we had two two community hospitals that in the benchmark data are listed at five percent administrative uh, salaries to clinical salaries that would jump to 34 um, percent another one that would that would jump from four to 28 percent and even Maine Medical as an academic medical center in that database jumps from 13 to 48%. So that benchmark data that's being used um, is inaccurate. Um, so in terms of how it's potentially being used today in the deliberations, I just wanna highlight that again for the, uh, for the board. Uh, two, in terms of the results uh, this year for the UVM Medical Center, again, we tried to be clear uh, with that um, in our response um, that there is one time money in that margin that you see today uh, that will not continue um, into, into FY24. So just wanna highlight that again for the board. And then finally, my, my last comment has to do with the focus on price when we talk about cost. Price is only one piece of the cost uh, puzzle. Um, the other piece is utilization. Um, and when you look at it from a cost, from a total cost of care uh, perspective, these numbers that even that are still on the on the screen here, the 23.8 percent, this number would look very, very different if this was um, if this was adjusted on a per capita uh, basis. And that is something that I hope we can move to um, as we continue to refine the um, the 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 data that's used in these deliberations. And that cost uh, per capita also applies to the expense um, of an organization. There was there was highlights of the growth in expense from one year to the next. That is because the UVM Medical Center is taking care of more people. Um, that cost component of the of of the equation also has to be looked on a on a per capita basis um, and not just in absolute uh, dollar numbers. So we actually are very much looking forward to the day that the that total cost of care and uh, population uh, based payments become the, the the predominant reimbursement mechanism because we're obviously very confident in how we'll operate in that uh, system thank you thank you for your comment mr vincent um i think i'm pronouncing the name right uh, dragos banu Yes, you did. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. 
My name is uh, Dragos. Uh, I'm a general internal medicine uh, physician. Um, I've delivered primary care almost entirely um, in rural communities. Um, I, uh, I used to practice uh, upstate uh, in New York for the last eight years um, at Dallas Hyde, one of the sister hospitals of our network, uh, and uh, transitioned here, uh, starting my third year uh, for the Academic Medical Center. Um, currently, provide care in Essex, and um, I thank you all for um, for this. This was very enlightening to me as. Um, a new Vermonter uh, and uh, learning um, how my new state uh, functions. Uh, but I wanted to give you just a, a glimpse uh, from my eyes uh, in my day to day um, delivering care. Um, and I can tell you uh, either that is in most rural communities, like I used to serve uh, upstate, uh, I have seen so much goodness uh, from this lead work from this network uh, to which I have remained loyal. Um, I have seen communities receive state-of-the-art care, such as enrolling in clinical studies, um, where um, otherwise it would be impossible. Um, since my arrival here, um, and as I mentioned, I'm starting my third year, uh, it is not all uh, beautiful. Uh, we have a lot of work to do, and I agree with all of you. Um, access probably top of my priority as a physician. Um, but I have seen, I have seen in a very limited time, um, hiring of new physicians, of new advanced care providers. And this is, re this really feels good uh, for many reasons, uh, obvious reasons. Uh, I have seen um, a psychiatrist join our primary care practice as part of the new uh, model of delivering care, uh, which has been a game changer. Um, and um, this is extremely positive from my eyes and from my colleagues' eyes. Um, and as colleagues, as I'm sure you do with your own colleagues, we talk and we speak on challenges, on personal issues, and on, on uh, what we can do better. And specifically from somebody that's new here, uh, relatively. Um, and same thing um, for, for the new staff we hire. Um, it's challenging, housing is challenging, um, costs are challenging, um, moving families is challenging. So I am really encouraged to see uh, from my eyes as a internal medicine doctor, as a member of this state, and also as a loyal worker, for the network that in my view, it's going in the right direction in a very limited amount of time. And I've only been here for two years. So um, take my comments with, with, uh, with a grain of salt. It's only from my view, but uh, it feels good. Thank you. Thank you for your comment and uh, your service in the state. Um, the next hand is Mark Bizanzo. Bizanzo? Thank you very much. Um, my name is Mark Bizanzo, and I'm an emergency physician that works clinically at Porter Hospital, um, uh, Central Vermont Hospital, and University of Vermont. Um, I'm also the um, quality chair for the network emergency departments, so I'm very involved in emergency care across the network, and I'm the associate chief quality officer at EVM. So I know today the board's going to make a choice, and that choice is going to impact the care that Vermonters receive for years to come. The UVM Health Network EDs are really the safety net for a significant portion of Vermont. We are constantly doing more, th more with less. We stabilize, care for, and discharge patients that at any other academic medical center in England would be admitted to the hospital. Um, I've worked in multiple different New England states in the um, 17 years since I finished residency, and I can tell you without a doubt we're more efficient and work harder than um, and, and do more with less than any other academic medical center I've worked at. In addition, UVM is really only this is the only safety net for Vermonters who need tertiary care. This is very different from other areas of New England where there's multiple tertiary care hospitals in a short um, in, a, in a short radius or a small radius. Um, our ICU is really the only tertiary care ICU um, around, and we're the only one who can help Vermonters when they're in their worst moments. 
One of the roles I serve, I work as a network physician coordinator, and I take calls at all hours of the day and night on weekends and on holidays, collaborating with emergency physicians across the state who need to transfer their patients to UVM. Many times the physicians I'm talking to are working in hospitals that are closer to Dartmouth or Bay State or Albany, but those hospitals are refusing to take the patients back even though they're critically sick, and oftentimes they're having a complication from care that they received at those hospitals. Unlike other states where these patients could be shuttled around to multiple different places, UVM becomes their only choice, and therefore we have to make capacity to take those patients. Um, when Vermonters need this medical care, they don't need budget cuts and long waits and overburden nurses and uh, providers uh, with less access to care. They need higher ca high caliber facilities that are modern and have all the infrastructure we need. They need well-trained physicians, nurses, and staff. <clears throat> we all agree Vermont has an access to care problem. Everyone on the call acknowledged that today. This pressure, though, really translates to the emergency departments across the network and across the state. These patients show up when they're, when they're finally decompensating to the point where they really need help. Um, emergently. And when they come in, they don't tell us we couldn't afford to pay for care. And that was why we didn't go. They tell us we couldn't get care due to long waits. And this is even for patients who are accessing non UVM health network services. This is not just patients who are trying to get into UVM clinics. The emergency departments are constantly working with limited resources to stabilize these patients um, and then coordinating their transfer to UVM. <clears throat> these the hospitals in the in Vermont are constantly absorbing sicker and sicker patients uh, because we we keep don't have capacity for them in UVM. So we need to get we need a day or two to kind of open up capacity and bring them in. Some of these patients are dying while waiting. We've seen those cases in, increase with frequency. <clears throat> the only way that Vermont um, not for profit hospitals are going to work well to serve all Vermonters is if we can continue to grow the health network so that we could expand. Um, our services and be able to better assist not only just the partner hospitals in the network, but all the Vermont hospitals, including the eight critical access hospitals. I think our, our mission uh, is the health network and the mission of the board are exactly the same. We want to provide the best care for all Vermonters. These are our neighbors, our friends, our relatives. The doctors who are working in the system that are all under unbearable stress are also neighbors, friends, and relatives. I can tell you for sure that we all come to work early, we all stay late, that we all take on additional work to improve quality and operations in our free time. We're not we're not operating any efficiently. We're the network's not for profit, and we're really looking to stabilize finances and ensure that we can continue to provide really good care to all the runners. I think there's only really one choice here, and that's that we have to look at this comprehensively and look at the strain the system's under when we're considering the budget. I hope we can work together and um, take continue to take good care for all the runners. Thanks for allowing me to comment. Thank you very much for your comment, Mr. Gazanzo. Uh, um, the next hand is Lewis first, Mr. First, or Dr. Yes. First, I believe. How are you? <laughs> How are you? Thank you, Chair Foster. Good afternoon. Good morning. And I want to just thank the, the, the board for allowing us to sit in and uh, hear your discussion. My name is Lewis First, and for the past 29 years, I have been chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Vermont Larner College of Medicine and chief of pediatrics of our UVM Children's Hospital located at the Medical Center campus in Burlington, the UVM Medical Center campus. Currently, my tenure as pediatric chair is the longest in the country. And I am proud of that fact that I have served in this role as long as I have. Not because I wanna call the Guinness Book of World Records, but because of how fortunate I believe our state is to have the pediatric physicians, nurses, and staff that have been recruited over the past several decades to provide state-of-the-art, state high-quality, cost-effective, family-centered pediatric care and preventive health strategies to the children in Vermont and upstate New York, the pandemic being a great example. Our ability to surpass national standards in the care of children with disorders like cystic fibrosis, inflammatory bowel disease, pediatric cancer is not something any of us should really take for granted. Our mission has always been to get it right here in Vermont and upstate New York and then share our innovations and care systems with the rest of the country and the world, which is what we are all about. Yet with each passing year that I've been here, I have begun to worry that there is a sense of complacency of our being taken for granted that we, of course, at our children's hospital, do whatever it takes to provide whatever children need in this state for their health care needs. And that is just not feasible. We see every child that needs to be seen. We are tucking children in left and right in our specialty center. But basically, you know, revenues are not the salvation in pediatrics. 
without the ability to have sufficient funds available to not just grow our programs, but simply maintain them, I worry that we will have to cut back essential programs that we've been able to offer for years with high performance outcomes, lower costs because of our inability to have the capital funding, let alone the programmatic funding to retain the remarkable people that make our children's hospital the go-to place when our children, our grandchildren, and our neighbor's children need us. Already this past year, we have had to put a pause on new referrals to our adolescent programs and our autism assessment programs due to lack of space, staff, and funds to meet the referrals we are receiving and we are trying to see these kids left and right. We have a neonatal intensive care unit that barely meets code and has been in need of new space for well over a decade now, if not longer. So if this motion passes, it would seem appropriate at a time, as you've all pointed out, when healthcare costs can certainly and are concerning, but it could, and certainly I might have been gonna worsen our ability to sustain the gains of pediatric care that require the capital funding and the staffing needed to hit that access point as the state's only children's hospital. The alternative of needing to send more of our pediatric patients out of state if we can't upkeep our our space, retain the staff that I've been so proud of for the past three decades, we must provide is not, is not an option that any of us want to see for the children and families of Vermont. I hope that you do factor in the future of children's health and our children's hospital when you vote on this motion. I want to thank you for your consideration, and I do hope, not in budget season, but during this year, that I have the opportunity to come back and update you all on how high quality and how cost effective our UVM Children's Hospital has been and I hope we'll continue to be as we look to the future. Thank you all very, very much for having the opportunity to share my thoughts. Thank you very much, Dr. First, for taking the time to attend the hearing and, and to share your thoughts. Um, next, um, uh, Deb Snell, Ms. Snell. Hello. Um, again, thank you for all the hard work and especially to Sarah Lindbergh and Elena Barub for all the work they put in, especially with the suggested motion language. Um, I, I do want to start off by saying that I totally appreciate the language in here. Um, I do hope that we continue to hold not only UVMMC, but the network accountable for reducing costs at the network level to reduce the top heavy management level and to really put money into recruiting primary care physicians and APRNs because that is what is needed at our state level as well. Um, I do hope that when we talk about benchmarking and market values that whatever benchmark we are using, we start using consistently and use it across all levels of employees at the hospital. And lastly, I just want to acknowledge that the uh, UVM Health Network Board recently sent a letter to legislators. Um, I personally, as an employee at the hospital, I'm not going to lie, I was embarrassed at the tactics that our network level was using against the Green Mountain Care Board. I don't think it was appreciated by the general public. And it's, it's, I hope that the network learns from this whole year's budget process that Vermonters come first, the patients come first, and we need to keep the patients before profits going. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Snell. Um, next, Sarah Polowski. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. My name is Sarah Palowski. I'm a child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist, and I trained in Vermont as a resident in psychiatry and completed my fellowship in child psychiatry here, too. I have worked across many settings in the mental health care system, across emergency room, inpatient, outpatient, and community mental health, among others. I serve as a clinical leader of primary care mental health integration with a focus on improving access to mental health care in primary care for all people of any age and any insurance at the UVM Health Network. I was proud to present this work to you last year with my colleagues as one of the many hoped for solutions for our mental health care crisis and lack of mental health care access. I am here today because mental health care is disproportionately impacted by budget cuts. And I see the future of mental health care funding at a concerning impasse at a time when we all can agree we are in a mental health care crisis and need more, not less, mental health care. 
As a board, you have pledged to improve our mental health care system. I am here because such endorsements require funding and programs such as the one I have presented to you become vulnerable with budget cuts. Medicare, Medicaid, and private insurances simply do not reimburse enough to make private practice psychiatry sustainable at scale, which is a main driver of lack of access to mental health care. Therefore, every day I see patients and families who rely on mental health care delivered through the primary care medical home because it is the only outpatient mental health care accessible to them. The only way we are able to accomplish this is through resources paid for by the UVM Health Network. As a service that is limited in revenue generation, but has nevertheless demonstrated itself to be invaluable to the community, budget cuts will affect us very directly and very dramatically. Recently, I met a mother of school-aged children, like myself, whose only access to a psychiatry consultation and diagnosis for her child was me, and the only access she had to the therapeutic interventions her and her family needed was a mental health, cl mental health clinician on our team who I connected her with the same day. This is the hour to hour story of my job. I hear again and again that without our team, they may be on a wait list for a year and they can't stand to watch their child suffer that long as any parent can attest to. I have also been the parent with a child on a wait list and I can appreciate the agony of that as I'm sure you can. If you have ever loved someone whom for whatever reason could not get the care they needed at the moment you felt they needed it most. Funding for mental health care is essential. Many of you agree publicly, and I appreciate as a provider of that care, your kind words of support. And while your words are of support, any choices which defund mental health care would be anything but supportive to us and the Vermonters we care for. Programs like ours are not financially sustainable through traditional health care payment mechanisms. We are costly with people power and need more time during each visit than a procedural visit, all while reimbursing less. Programs like ours rely on sharing financial resources, usually taken in by more lucrative departments. Budget cuts will drastically and directly limit our ability to care for our fellow Vermonters and limit expansion of our services to communities in need across the state. When you make decisions about budgets, I hope you think of the mothers who agonize when mental health care is made further inaccessible and more programs such as ours, of which you were so supportive about last year, are forced to end and more emergency room mental health care results. I'll finish by saying thank you for listening. Thank you for your words of mental health care support publicly. And I do hope that in making choices, you can reconcile those words with the matching decisions. Thank you very much. Um, the next hand is David Schneider. Mr. Schneider, please go ahead. Hi there, my name is uh, David Schneider. I'm uh, the Chief of Cardiology at the University of Vermont Medical Center. Um, and I'd like to also uh, focus on the clinical aspect of this. Um, I'm very proud to say we deliver outstanding cardiac care to the patients of our state. Um, and the medical center is essential to care for patients, both with chronic and acute conditions. Um, the pandemic really had a, a damaging impact throughout the country on healthcare, and there are many healthcare workers who left um, healthcare during that time. And unfortunately, we still have not stabilized the system. And because of that, we're short on personnel and we have to use travelers, which drive higher expense. Uh, I'm proud of my institution that we use those travelers so that we can actually provide the care that patients need. When someone has a heart attack, they literally have their life threatened. And if they can't get access to our institution, they will suffer either the consequences of potential death or um, greater morbidity associated with the heart attack. We struggle today with getting patients in in a timely manner. I'm worried that budget cuts will actually further have further implications and really reduce our ability to provide that life-saving care. It's important to note that having been in this state for more than 20 years, I'm excited to say that I actually take care of some patients who I met during my first years in this uh, state and at this institution who came in with a heart attack and who now continue a very active and vibrant life because they received acute care in a timely manner and then appropriate subsequent care to really prevent second events throughout my entire career here, it's really been about providing 
appropriate acute care and really working to prevent both primary events and secondary events. I'm proud of my time here. I'm very concerned that reducing the budget as, as proposed could have negative implications in our ability to carry out this essential mission. We are the only cath lab in the state that's very appropriate, but we actually need to support that service so that we can provide this, this very important uh, care to the patients of our region. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Dr. Schneider. Um, Ham Davis, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've been really critical of this process, of the board's process over the last several months. And uh, given that, I, I would just comment that uh, I think that the at the end of the day, uh, when you look at the that the uh, that the board has uh, very done very well in uh, taking care of its really its very first responsibility, which is to maintain the the ability of the academic medical center to function. That was not a given. It was certainly not necessarily expected in the light of the uh, what has what uh, had the board has talked about over the last several months and and especially recently. So I think that is that is excellent. I mean, the fact of the matter is that um, that that it looks to me like uh, UVM can handle this uh, without without much trouble. Uh, the the further comment would be that uh, I continue to think that the that the the board is not really grappling with the second real the most response the uh, biggest problem that they have which is getting the, uh, the rest of the hospitals uh, within some kind of a reasonable uh, system. We have, we have 14 hospitals for 600, 625,000 people. That's way more than we need. Um, and, the, and, and, and I think that Rick Vincent is completely right that if you, if you shift it to cost per capita, which is the way we actually pay for healthcare, that UVM would look better. But the challenge now, it seems to me, is for the board to consider, really start considering the, the, the underlying issues of the sustainability project that started with member homes back in 2019. And that would, be, that would involve looking at the mass of data uh, that describes the, not only the uh, cost efficiency and quality, high, very high quality of UVM compared to the rest of the UVM hospitals, but looks at very important issues in that small hospital network. That will be much harder, and uh, and I, I wish you good luck with that. Thank you. Um, thank you for your comment, Mr. Davis. Um, we we are, as a number of people probably recognize, we'll, we will be engaging in the Act 167 work really uh, soon. I think it's actually beginning now. Um, and Mr. Davis, I've heard you comment on this a couple of times. I would love your participation in that. Um, I will put you in contact with um, our consultant because I've, I've heard you on this and I think you're right. Um, there's a lot of really important work to be done um, in, in that realm. Um, that work should be starting, I think, this month, next month, December. And I personally view it as really, really important work. Um, the next person whose hand raised is Katie. Um, Katie, if you could just say your question. Yes, um, this is, I'm Katie Arison. I'm one of the uh, doctors and owners of Matry Healthcare um, in South Burlington. And I just I wanted to make a couple comments. One is that we, I obviously completely agree that UVM Medical Center is essential to providing care for our patients in our community. I mean, we do all of our deliveries at UVM Medical Center, so we would not be able to take care of the women in the community that we take care of if UVM were not to continue to function and provide excellent care for the women that we need to refer to them. But my biggest concern, I feel that a lot of this has been talking about how we will be losing access to patient care if the budget doesn't continue to, continue to increase for UVM over time. But I think it's really important to recognize what that does do, do to the rest of the community providers and that our budgets do not increase substantially year after year despite the insane amount of increase in cost we have from inflation, as well as com competing with UVM's ability to pay their nurses and their medical assistants 
and their support staff more than we can afford to pay some of our staff. So I think as the only other, pro other provider in the community that provides obstetric care to women in the community, we do about 780 deliveries a year. UVM could not absorb 780 women to take care of and deliver annually if we were to shut our doors. And I think the sustainability of increasing the budget every year at substantial rates, at substantial rates that don't only impact the Vermonter's cost of healthcare, but also impact what we have to pay for our employees to get healthcare and for ourselves to get healthcare, it really impacts the sustainability of the private practices in this community who provide a very, very important service to these patients. I obviously feel very passionate about women's health care, and we, we work very hard to get as many patients and women seen in a timely manner as we can. We see patients over lunch to avoid them going to the emergency room and after hours as well. So I think that I don't disagree that we need to keep UVM working. We need them, and I agree that there are specialists there that are extremely important for us. So I'm not saying that I don't believe in continuing to support the hospital, but I think it's really critical to think about the impact of the hospital's budget and how it has an impact on the community providers and essentially, eventually, access to care throughout our state and our community. Thank you for listening. Um, thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Susan Ridgen. Hi, thank you. Um, for the record, I'm Susan Ridson of Vermont Health First. We're uh, an independent practice association representing 62 physician-owned practices in Vermont. And I just want to thank the board and staff and everyone involved in this process for this hard work. Uh, we definitely support the board's attention to healthcare access and affordability in these hearings. Uh, we also appreciate the board's consideration of the downstream negative effects um, that multiple years of increases in commercial insurance rates and hospital budgets have had on high value community providers such as Dr. Arison at Maytree, um, and then the rest of the healthcare system and just everyday Vermonters. Um, as Chair Foster, you have stated and others have stated, community providers have had to face many of the same headwinds of the hospitals but because they have little to no negotiating power with public um, and private payers, they're unable to increase their already comparatively much lower um, reimbursement rates to cover the ever increasing costs. As a result, um, these independent practitioners must cut their costs to the bone, optimize efficiencies just to survive. It's imperative that all players in our healthcare system similarly rein in their spending and find efficiencies, um, such as the ones that um, your staff and uh, board members have pointed out are um, available. Vermonters just simply can't afford um, for our system to do anything but that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I'll turn to uh, Roger. Um, Roger, your hand is coming up and down. Do you have a public comment? Hi, sorry. Yep, I do. Um, I had I had kind of three thoughts on this. Uh, the first is that, I mean, I, I guess to take a step back, we all support the hospital. I mean, I was born at the hospital. My kids are born at the hospital. My mom was born at the hospital. My grand, I mean, people die. My my grandma parents passed away, you know, so that the hospital is, is a, is a vital community resource. And I don't think anyone is um, suggesting that's not, that's not the case. And so that this, the idea that um, anyone is, is advocating for something that's not uh, kind of continued quality care at the hospital, I think is, is just, is just incorrect and, and misguided, honestly. Um, that said, I think it's really important to take a step back from a financial perspective and say, I, you know, we can get lost in the, the sort of month to month or annual metrics of, of whether it's performance or cost increase, um, 
or, or that kind of thing. But but when you when you sit back from a sort of Vermonter's perspective, um, health the cost that we are paying for healthcare is is out of control, and it's honestly out of control compared to other states, to other developed countries. It's 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 and when I say out of control, it is. I mean, I was on the the select board in the town of Richmond, um, and all any any benefit increases that we are trying to give to employees that the employees are expecting is all going into healthcare. So I think it's it's really important to, to honestly take a step back and, and just say, what is the, this overall? Where are we with the overall rate of increase? Um, and and I think the idea that um, how do we control that? Uh, is there a way to control it without cutting services? That seems obvious. Well, then let's figure out how to do that. But this, um, I mean, I guess I would have to call it a threat that, well, we're going to have to cut services. The thing I would remind the board is that public health is about making choices to find the, the sort of relative goodness to society, if that makes sense. Public health is about making decisions that hurt some people and help others, because ultimately this is a, a zero-sum game to a certain extent, right? So decisions are going to hurt some people and help other people. And we're trying to maximize the public good. Um, and people are limiting care. There are real health impacts to the increase in costs that we have had um, in, in this state in the last 15 years. That's just a fact. That's just a fact that the cost increases are limiting access to care from Vermonters. Um, and so are there are there services that that we need to cut to to sort of get that back under control? Uh, maybe let's let's look at them. Let's talk about that. Are there services that people could go to Boston? Maybe we can pay people to go to Boston um, or other kind of regional regional places to get care that that we don't need to do up here. But I think just the, the threat of, oh, well, we're going to have to cut services. Well, we are cutting services. That is what is happening now. Um and honestly, the final thing I'll throw out there in terms of this regulation is this this sort of monopoly of healthcare is something that that the network has wanted. So the the aggressive expansion um, is is something that the network has really worked for and has been a goal. And I don't I don't understand how you could regulate how you can have any kind of a limit from a, a cost perspective that isn't regulatory. Like what's the what's the other limit, right? They don't we don't want competition. We've really fought. I mean, the I think the um, surgery center is, is a good example of something where the 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 network, the UVM network, fought competition. And so then, what's what's the other mechanism for limiting that cost growth? And I and it's it's the board. I mean, that's it. Now that's all we're left with. Patients don't have choice. We have wait times that are and it's and it's the board. So. Thank you for hearing my uh, my comment, and sorry about the uncertainty at the beginning there. No problem. Thank you for participating in your comment. Um, I'm going to go, Ms. Gutwin, raise her hand again. I'm going to go to her, and then I'll give the healthcare advocate the, the final word. And I'll be brief. I just uh, wanted the board to be aware that uh, Dr. Lewis failed to mention the pediatric care of disabled children. I launched the Kids Rehab Gym from the pleas of doctors and parents asking me to fill the unmet need. And I reached out to him when establishing this care, but never received a response. I no longer run the business. Um, it's now turned into a nonprofit just to be able to survive. Um, I just bring this up as an example of UVM's lack of collaboration or even interest with community providers outside itself. And I do encourage um, Dr. Lewis to get a hold of Kids Rehab Gym, take a visit. Um, I, I, I would think that you are a great pediatrician and I would think this would fit within your interest. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Mark Hage. Thank you, Chair Foster. Um, for the record, my Mark Hage, the Director of Benefit Programs at Vermont NEA and my union and Vermont State Employees Association jointly weighed in on this process uh, in late August. And I want to just reiterate the points that we made in that letter and also 
while the 3.1% charge recommendation here, the increase is probably lower than many would have expected. It is still, in my estimation, too high, and I think it could be lower and should be lower. I've been doing this work in healthcare now for my union and at the local level as a former teacher for more than 20 years. And I have been told repeatedly over that time uh, that we're going to see lower costs and we're going to see improved access and we're going to see better quality. And frankly, it just hasn't materialized. And I'm the person here at the office who takes the calls from members and their families who cannot afford their health care. And that suffering and that deprivation, and I know you know this, but I'm compelled to say it, that suffering and deprivation is real. And it's worsening every year. A month ago, I stood in line at a pharmacy to fill a prescription, and I listened to a gentleman plead to take his medication from the woman behind the counter so he could go home, but he couldn't leave because he couldn't afford the $400 out of pocket. That story plays out in multiple capacities every single day here in Vermont and across the country. So I deeply appreciate your work. I know how hard it is. And as others have already noted, this is not those of us taking issue with UVMHN. This is not we don't think the hospital is essential or we don't value hospital care. These costs are too high and they are hurting an awful lot of people. I want to finally say on a personal note, I found the recent written attack on this board by the network to be appalling and shameful. And those who wrote it should issue an apology. And frankly, they should consider stepping down from their position. Thank you. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Hage. Um, and I'll turn to the healthcare advocate, uh, Mr. Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, my name is Mike Fisher. I am the healthcare advocate. Um, I, 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 it, it, it's important to say um, uh, to appreciate the process. This is um, a great deal of work has gone into um, getting us to where we are today um, from board staff, from board members, um, from the health network, from UVM. And um, I, I really want to appreciate all of the public commenters from both within, um, uh, employed by UVM and, uh, and, and the other ones. Um, this has been, a, a, I think, an important conversation with many great points that uh, I would put my name behind. Um, at the very beginning of this process, um, the um, hospital association uh, said, um, hey, if you know people who are not able to pay their bills, send them to me. Now, we thought about that seriously. A number of people you know, called me up and said, hey, why don't you take out an ad and tell people to call the hospital association if they can't pay their bills? Um, we thought about it for a little bit and decided against it um, because that would be using people as a pawn. And um, my office works hard, uh, as do many people here, to help people get the care they need. Um, but it speaks to uh, sort of a recognition of what's really going on in our community. And, um, you know, I think the piece of data that's that uh, that we have is the last um, household survey that recognizes 44% of Vermonters who are commercially insured are are underinsured. Now, what do you do if your exposure, uh, your out of pocket exposure, is a high percentage of your income? How do you behave? You know, let alone if your bills are a high percentage of your of your income. Um, the way we experience people uh, responding to that pressure is they wait. They hope it gets better. Now, this is, in my experience, particularly acute in the world of mental health. When people have um, high exposure for the care that they need, 
they they don't go get the care until it's most acute. And so um, uh, I also I I, I want to recognize um, that the uh, the wait times issue and the uh, and people waiting to get care because of affordability are not exclusive. They're compounding. You wait. You hope it gets better. And then when you're feeling desperate, you call and then you get in line for a long wait time. So um, I really wanted to make those points um, and I wanted to appreciate the board for its work. And, and I, I'm sorry, I should have said this up front. Uh, like others have said, um, uh, we continue to be concerned about the amount of increase that is represented in this motion. Um, 3.1 percent uh, uh, will. Uh, we are concerned that it's too high, and we are also concerned that the um, about the NPR increase as being um, unsustainable. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. And I, there's a lot of people on this. There's a lot of people at the hearing, and I, I really appreciate the public participation in this. You can see we have a lot of different views and different voices, and that's what we're here to listen to as we try and make the best decisions we possibly can for Vermonters. So I appreciate the discussion, and thank you everyone so much for taking the time to weigh in on really critical decisions for our state. It's important, so thank you. Um, I will move to approve the University of Vermont Medical Center's budget as modified hereby with a 23.8% increase from fiscal year 2022 actual to fiscal year 2024 budgeted NPR slash FPP, a 3.1% charge increase from fiscal year 23 to 24 reduced from 10% and subject to the standard budget conditions as approved by board and an additional condition as follows. UVMMC shall submit to the board within three months a plan addressing UVMMC's efforts to reduce costs and control overall expense growth in connection with, among other things, information technology, human resources, management, and revenue cycle management. Further, UVMMC is required to meet monthly with board staff for monitoring purposes. A second. Is there any board discussion? Um, I would just make one point myself, which is I think based on um, the record before us, the monitoring makes sense here. Uh, we are concerned about UVM's ability to uh, provide all the care that we need. And I think that the um, uh, additional condition relating to working with UVM to help control the expense growth is something the board should be doing. And I think we can do it collaboratively so that we are all working together to serve the community. Is there any other board discussion? I would, um, on the condition, um, I don't think this needs to change the condition. I would just say that the efforts and the planning should uh, take into consideration um, any Act 167 sustainability efforts so that um, we're not, so that all the efforts are rowing in the same direction. So again, I don't think that changes the condition. I just wanted to say that out loud. Great, thank you, I agree. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And um, the motion carries uh, four, with four votes, Dr. Merman abstained. Um, it's almost noon and I wanna make sure we give everyone a little break. So why don't we take 15 minutes and then we'll turn to the next two network hospitals at um, 12.10, if that's okay with everyone. So we'll adjourn until 12.10, thank you. All right, I'll reconvene our hearing of September 13th, 2023. Um, and we've brought Dr. Uh, David Merman back. Um, we had a issue pop up for a care board member that they need to go and take care of. And this is going to cause a scheduling change today. And I know a lot of people 
made time to be here, um, so I'll apologize, but um, uh, someone needs to be elsewhere uh, right now. And so we're going to just take up um, the standard conditions and then we'll turn to Porter and um, uh, CBMC on Friday. So again, we're gonna do the standard conditions and then we're gonna do Porter and CBMC on Friday. And I apologize for the unexpected uh, change. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Mr. McCracken. <clears throat> um, thank you, uh, Chair Foster. Um, sorry, Elena, should I share or are you sharing? I can probably present here. Hold on a second. Uh, let me know if you can see the screen. Okay. <clears throat> so um, we're, we're going back to here are the standard budget conditions. We've uh, gone through this um, at a couple of prior meetings. Uh, there's one other sort of minor change that I'll flag for the board. Um, <clears throat> And then if the board is ready, there's some suggested motion language here. Um, as a kind of reminder, these are the baseline or default conditions that would get included with budget orders as the approvals indicate um, as the board goes through. They can, um, as the board has done, be modified or supplemented for a particular hospital based on, on that hospital. Uh, so <clears throat> there are no changes to these conditions from what I had previously presented to the board. Uh, there are some reporting conditions around here, also uh, no changes from what had previously been presented. <clears throat> uh, there's an additional wait times condition that I presented at our last meeting, um, but there are no further changes around that. I have uh, one <clears throat> change here in condition K, which is, I think, really a drafting change to make it clear that the requirement here is for hospitals to participate in the board's work pursuant to Act 167. That includes the community engagement process. Substantively, I don't, uh, it's not a change from what was intended previously. It's just making clear that that was the intention. Um, and that was the only change um, that we've made to the proposed standard conditions. Um, Chair Foster at the last meeting had raised the possibility of including a condition around um, reporting how ACO uh, primary care funds were, a particular ACO um, incentive funds were received, used, and accounted for, and um, we think that that's uh, something we can address through uh, the ACO process and review of the ACO's um, programs and payments. Um, so we haven't suggested adding that as a condition uh, for the hospital budget orders. Uh, so I will, I'll pause there and um, take any uh, board member questions or comments. And there's um, some uh, potential motion language on the slide here. Thank you. Any board member questions or comments or discussion?
Um, I'll say that um, I appreciate the team looking into my request and with their recommendation on the additional condition I had proposed, and that I think is a, an appropriate recommendation. Um, the only other question I had, Mr. McCracken, is um, there's motion language here. I forget if we received public comment and healthcare advocate comment last time or if we need to do so in connection with this motion. Do you have a recollection? <clears throat> Um, we have taken some public comment on um, the suggested conditions here before. There's um, certainly no harm in taking public comment again. Great. All right, seeing um, nothing from the board, I will open up public comment um, relating to this motion and to the conditions. Mr. Chair, Mike Fisher here, no further comment. Great. And I will ask if there is a board motion to be made. I can move that we approve the standard budget conditions as presented to the board today to be included as the default conditions for the fiscal year. 24 hospital budget orders subject to any changes to the budget conditions or additional conditions approved by the board for any specific hospitals for avoidance of doubt these are the standard budget conditions referenced in the previously approved fiscal year 24 hospital budget motions and approvals i please second that I will. any other board discussion All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And the motion is uh, carried unanimously. Thank you very much, Mr. McCracken. Um, I don't think we have anything else on the agenda that we can get to today. Um, I think on Friday we are going to be a little press for time and so we'll have to try and be expeditious and we'll work with our staff to see if there is any opportunity to extend time if need be or to address the change in schedule. Um, so that is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. I'll second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, aye. 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 The motion carries and um, thank you everyone for attending and for your participation um, today and have a good day. We are adjourned.